Welcome to the Listen to This Bull Live Show. My name is Matt Mulholland, and I am all alone again. No Remington today. He was busy doing stuff. I got the wrong icon up in the corner somehow. Fix that. Look at that. National Claims is due. It's now sponsoring Listen to This Bull. So now they've got a little icon there. I'm super proud of that. It took it took a lot for me not to be so uh, unprofessional that they, they couldn't do that. So I... I'm proud of myself. I'm going to have a beer just because of that. I might say fuck a few times. No, I, I, I did my part. Now it's okay, I think. Anyway, this is an interesting episode. We're going to talk about reputation. And that kind of goes hand in hand with what I just said with uh, listen to this bull and its reputation. So I've got someone in the wings uh, that has has an interesting insight on how this goes down. He does uh, mostly large loss, uh, but... Uh, between his experience and mine going from volume, small losses, and how that reputation changes uh, to his large loss reputation. I think we have a lot to offer you for today's episode. So stay tuned. I'm going to run the intro and we'll get back into this. If you, oh, I lost everything. There it is. If you are watching this live, the benefit of watching live is that you can put a comment in and ask a question um, and partake in, in part of the conversation. We'd love to be able to post your comments up on the screen, and we'd love to answer your questions more than anything else. I am drinking at work. Uh, thank you, Lucian. But I often drink at this job. This is one that uh, somebody got for me recently because they said it looked like me. It's got a red bearded guy named and it's Jeremiah Red, and it's a red, um, kind of like Killian's. It's actually pretty good. It tastes an awful lot like Killian's. Anyway, without further ado, I've got David Princeton um, in the wings. He is a PA with Advocate Claim Service out of Wisconsin. And we're going to talk to you guys about the importance of reputation. And really, if it really matters, I don't, I don't even know if it really does. We're going to find out. Hey, Dave. Hey, Matt. How, How you doing? doing? Pretty good. You know what I like? I like the beginning of episodes where I pull someone on and I say, hey, as if we hadn't been talking for the last half hour. And we pretend that uh, that I think that's a funny thing. That's that's the fourth wall, man. That's the fourth wall. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it might just be the fourth wall. All right. Well, so we're talking about reputation. And I, I think that uh, you being a PA and me being a PA, we're going to be able to bring a public adjuster perspective to this. Um, it's a shame we don't have a contractor, though. So if there is a uh, opportunity for me to get a uh, neck tattoo on or someone like that, I'm going to go ahead and pull him on to get his perspective. But until that happens, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about it. So maybe you can set the stage for us. What are we actually talking about? What is the real question? Um, so what is the real question of reputation? So for me, it's the, it's the rhetoric by which people choose to go about describing the other side. And I think that's the thing that people will tag to you and remember about you, uh, longer than your actual interaction. So that to me is kind of that core of what is reputation. Um, you know, it's how you describe your own work. It's how you describe the work of others. And it's how you describe the industry that we're all a part of, the in, in the insurance industry as a whole, right? All right. So if uh, we're talking about reputation, that, that means the way other people are talking about us. Well, yep. Um, and what is, what are you what matter, are you giving them? Matter what other people think about you professionally, right? I know it matters to some people, especially in today's uh, day and age about social media. They want people to like them, um, but they don't really care if someone doesn't like them. In fact, some people go out of their way. You call them trolls. They go out of their way to just be a dick online or something just because they can. They don't see you face to face. Maybe they don't know who you are. And I like to make comments that make themselves feel good for some reason. I get that a lot from people outside of our industry that comment on different things that I've done. Yeah, but, uh, well, but that also speaks to their brand, their credibility and Right. And uh, uh, I don't know if there is such a thing as bad publicity uh, when it comes to trying to put oh, listen to this poll 
out in many many people's ears, right? Or the National Claimants, oh, National Claim Institute up there, right? So, um, so I don't know that it's bad to have a large audience or have that kind of engagement. Um, uh, if you follow Gary V at all, uh, I love the way that he kind of addresses, you know, his his trolls that come out there and try to talk negatively. He just addresses it with love and compassion, right? And uh, and ultimately, you know, tries to. I don't know if he's trying to convert um, them to followers, but he just meets him with on a genuine plane. Right. So meet him. Yeah. I mean, as a PA, when I was when I was um, fully involved doing stuff as a PA um, and, and I know that the other uh, other companies that I work with these days, uh, Coastal Claims does this now. Uh, a lot of the, the large volume people, they, they will spend time on Facebook and they'll answer people's questions and just give away free information. And that's how they attract people to want to even work with them, which is pretty cool. Uh, but that that kind of a reputation for being helpful can follow you too. I can tell you this: I uh, I still get questions to this day, and it probably has a lot to do with this live and the NCI. People definitely uh, attempt to get some um, as much information as they can from good sources if they can. Uh, reputation matters, especially being a public adjuster. I you know what I brought this topic up. And it's been two weeks, unfortunately, so it, there's a little bit of depth to the way that this was going down. But I brought this pop topic up with you specifically because there was a video that was posted online where someone had a roof snake and they were attempting repairs in front of another adjuster. The state, the the state adjuster farm adjuster was, one? Both, both of them, both the adjuster mm -hmm. and the contractor, I believe it was a contractor, were definitely not at their best. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in that video. But posting that kind of a thing online can develop a reputation for a PA with the carriers. Right. You know, I think that there's probably some risk involved in that kind of a thing. You might get a reputation boost from one group and a reputation hit from another. And one of them is gonna be more important than the other. So so one of the things, that, so I, I think I've seen the video you're talking about um, uh, where they were basically talking about, I, uh, I believe the adjuster said something to the effect of like, I'm not seeing a genuine interest to try to attempt to repair. And then the roofer was insisting that the adjuster show him how to repair the roof. And then yeah. there's a dispute about whether or not a tear in the shingle was caused by one or the other, right? So so that's the same video? Yeah, so, yeah. adjuster so, was basically saying that he uh, he doesn't agree that it's not repairable and then in the same breath, he would say, I'm not a roofer. I'm not qualified yeah. to make that statement. Exactly. And then the roofer was ignoring that portion of it, unfortunately, and was just kind of berating the guy for uh, not coming to a decision on other things, which was right. kind of pointless. But right. the real issue, and, and I brought this up to some of my students, I think the real issue is what kind of a reputation do you develop with people that are likely to pay for things or not pay for things if you post a video like that. Do right. you think that the carriers would find that? Well, so so in uh, Matt, maybe for the benefit of the audience, so I wasn't always a PA. I grew up on the carrier side. Um, so I, you know, I was an adjuster for call it about 15 years of my career. Um, then I was in uh, at a commercial brokerage as a claim consultant, director of corporate risk for a private equity group, and then started my own business, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of the short realm of it to basically say this is, is that the, that moment that happened there was such a lost opportunity for the person gathering the evidence, right? And so now what both sides have is a piece of, um, is a piece of evidence that both sides can contextualize against the other and no one's going to win, right? So if you showed that video to a jury, what's the point in showing it to them? You, you've lost you've lost relevance to it um, because of the the lack of emotional intelligence in those moments by both parties and so so it's it's kind of neutralized right um, sure. so the uh, um, the the reputation piece right so if the if this was a moment for that that roofer to gain a lot of credibility in both communities by possibly like talking through how to conduct that repair as opposed to talking to the adjuster Right. You know, or asking the adjuster questions like, is this consistent with your training and understanding of how to conduct that repair? Where do we separate? Where do we deviate? Right. Um, and so, like, you could have created a beautiful record in that moment 
Um, but instead you have somebody who's kind of saying back to uh, the adjuster, like, it doesn't matter, it's going to the attorneys anyways, right? And you have the homeowner literally on the ground watching all this happen. Yeah, and, imagine what they're thinking. Exactly, right? And so like when I think of when I think of the role of a public adjuster to be a knowledgeable advocate for that policyholder, right? To guide them through this process that can have a million turns, but ultimately one goal, which is to have a covered loss fully compensated, right? Like the carrier yeah. and the public adjuster have that same goal, which is to provide every benefit available under the policy. That's how the that's how I believe the system was designed and meant to function, right? So so now, yeah, so now you have now you have credibility loss, in my opinion, more so on the contractor side than the adjuster side. And yeah, I think so. Yeah. And there was one thing the adjuster said uh, that I really identify with. Right. So I'm not a damages public adjuster. Right. My days of writing estimates have long been behind me. Um, I spent more time doing quality assurance checks on estimates than actually being out in the field writing them. Right. So checking for all the little boxes. Right. And. So when the adjuster when the adjuster said, "Well, I don't I don't know how to repair this. My job is to fulfill the promise of the policy, right? Like that's where I focus my time, my efforts, and I bring in incredibly knowledgeable people like a Matthew Mulholland that knows how these things should be assembled, torn down, right? Implications of code, those subject matter experts in those fields, those building consultants, right? That's where um, a lot of the value of promise fulfillment and damages then get married together." Uh, at least in the world that I, I try to form around myself. Uh, here's, here's somebody talking about, uh, well, I didn't realize it said snake farm, <laughs> but snake farm inspections are typically just like that uh, little video. And, yeah. and, and that might be true. I mean, they, the state farm adjusters or most of them, they don't really have authority to make a decision one way or the other. They're saying what they're supposed to say. And the vast majority of them, the vast majority doing everything they can with their hands tied up. Right. Well, so let me, can. let me go back to a, a thing that you said, right? So, so we've talked about kind of their interactions in that video, but you just mentioned authority. So who is the audience of every claim? It's not the adjuster you're dealing with. It's not the manager that, that is above them. It's typically an associate manager, a branch manager, an executive vice president of claims, a corporate general counsel, a CFO, a CEO. It's it's all of these other layers of management that is your actual audience of every correspondence you make. So, and I don't mean to call out the person that you know used the the bad descriptor of an insurance company, right? Uh, in terms of their cute name, but like, so if that person ever has a claim against them that ends up in a legal realm. And now, you know, there's evidence, right? There's evidence that exists about a bias or about an impression, right? Um, that they have of that particular insurance company. And so it's it's those types of things that like when you think of the rhetoric, right? So that's the both sides rhetoric and reputation. Like I actually have up on my screen here uh, something that's really interesting. So, you know, there's associations more, you know, so, you know, National uh, Public Adjuster Association or NAPIA, right? Um, so there's NAPI on our side, and then there's a bunch of industry ones on the other side, on the carrier side. I have a, I have a thing up here that says, you know, so dealing with public adjusters, and this is in a virtual university environment, right? Dealing with public adjusters, hurricanes and other communal disasters draw public adjusters to the affected areas like sharks to the smell of blood. Where do you think the rest of that lesson is going to go when that is the opening sentence? I mean, public this adjusters is are sharks. And, and this, they're and this greedy, is to and they're going to go at something like, right. yeah, that's that's crap. Right. And this um, is supposed to, this is supposed to inform somebody newer to the industry about advocates on the other side of a claim. Right? Yeah. So we're, so we're apparently blood are sharks drawn to the smell of blood, right? Or, or we can say snake farm reinspections right. or something right. along those lines. I can tell you this, if you're talking about the reputation of an insurance carrier to your clients, mm -hmm. it is not in your best interest to talk shit about the insurance company. Right. You know what? Those people spent money on that carrier. They probably spent some time evaluating which carrier to get. They might have been told by someone down the road real quick to just use this one and they went with that one, or they might have spent days weeks trying to evaluate who to get. They made a decision. 
And if you talk shit about their carrier, you're talking shit about a decision that they made instead right. of their carrier more than anything else. They're going to take it personally, and you don't even realize it. Now, so, if they start talking shit first, then it's fair game, I think. So uh, that, you're, not gonna, you're gonna actually going to destroy your own re, uh, relationship with a policyholder if you start talking shit about their carrier. Are, are you familiar with a guy named Roger Housen out in Washington? No. No. So uh, so the guy is literally an institution in the state of Washington, uh, beloved by both sides, is a PA, um, you know, hired as expert witnesses by both sides to address, you know, claim disputes and all that kind of stuff. What's um, his name? Uh, Roger Housen. So I can get you info. Um, but so Roger is was really interesting. So I had a chance to uh, meet him virtually having a conversation. He shared some really striking, um, really striking statistical information with me. I don't know the source of it, so I don't know how credible it is, but I'll, I'll give it credibility because it was Roger. So so divorce rate in America, right? 50-50 any given day. It's 90-10 if you have an insurance claim because one spouse blames the other spouse for the decision about the policy they ended up with or the denial that came or the lack of coverage for something because of the stress that it puts on the relationship. What, what, what do you mean 90, 10? What is 90? Oh, so, you, so if you, if you're a couple and you're married in, in the U S you have a 50, 50 shot at your marriage lasting. If you have right. an insurance claim, it's 90% likely to fail 10% likely to survive. The claim is 90% likely to fail. No, no, the marriage. So they're 90% because of the likely stress to of the claim. Carriers. Because of the stress of the claim, right? So you're, you get a denial. The, the Are you kidding one, me? 90% one spouse, of them yeah. change insurance carriers? I can't tell no, you. No, not change they insurance might... carriers. They, they, don't. They, they get divorced. If you're a married couple and you have an insurance claim, you oh, are 90% likely ends. to end up divorced if your claim goes wrong. Because of the stress. Okay. Because of the stress. I thought we were talking about the marriage as a, as a metaphor. Oh, no. Sorry. Not, a, not analogizing the carrier marriage. and the person. Yeah. That yep. sucks. So having yep. an insurance claim can destroy marriages. Yep. It causes, it causes one party to resent the other because usually it's one person that makes the insurance decision in the household. Right. The uh, so 10 so yeah, percent of married couples that have an insurance claim that go poorly, right, are likely to survive it, right? That's really fucked up, right? Right. So you know, you talk about the emotional toll or like bad mouthing. And so in Wisconsin here, right, um, our largest employers are insurance companies. So whether it's health, whether it's property and casualty, my literally my entire family is in insurance. They, they either own agencies, work for carriers, you know, everything else. Like, that's just how it is. Welcome to the Midwest. So if you if you think about talking poorly about and a like if I was your client and you talk poorly about it, you're probably talking about my stepdad. You're probably talking about my uncle. You know, like you're probably talking about all these people that um, I know to be well intentioned. Right. And you just have you have to just, you know, manage the process. Uh, of the claim, right? Uh, uh, without necessarily talking bad, like, so what does talking bad do? Like, what's the effect of it? Does it get like it gives you maybe some dopamine, right? A little serotonin release because you think you know you're building rapport, right? Um, but you could also be driving a wedge. You could also be creating a record that goes against you later. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah, and so uh, so yeah, so it becomes it becomes really really problematic. Um, when oh, you shit. keep putting negative things out there. Yeah, this topic is deeper than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Well, I so should have known better since Sarah Parker got me in touch with you. I should have known. <laughs> well, so here's one thing beautiful about Sarah Parker, right? So her message about the compassion that's needed and the empathy and the and the drought that exists. So, so one of the things that I always try to do every claim that I'm involved in I try to do the adjuster's job for them. I get all the documentation. I put it all together. I make it all nice and logical. Excel spreadsheets are detailed and filled out, right? I mm -hmm. When I submit it, I submit it with an explanation, a reading guide, right? How to work this tool, how to go simple, through it. Simple, bullet boom, points. Boom, boom, boom. They through it all. I've, I've, already, I've already written in my cover letter, right? I've already written in my cover letter the part I want them to copy and paste into their notes right? Or copy and paste to go to the manager for approval to pay, right? Um, you know, so all of that, all of that legwork is done. 
And then uh, if you do it well enough, like you want, you, they have to ask questions. They have to justify their existence, right? Whether it's an engineer, whether it's the adjuster, you know, uh, any type of consultant involved in anything. Hey, David. Yeah. I want to fuck with somebody real quick. Uh, oh. Neck tattoo was in the wings and there we he go. just wanted to grab a beer, but I'm going to pull him on real quick to an empty sure. screen and make him race back. Yeah. Neck tattoo. Oh. Oh my God, where are you? Oh, ah, oh, man. There he is. There he is. Jeez, making us wait. Oh, mic check. All right, your audio is wrong anyway. Your mic's not working. Give me one second. All right, fix your mic. I do. I do appreciate the Hurley you attitude. Your mouth or something. I do. I do appreciate the Hurley lifestyle and the Hurley attitude. So. Yeah. I'm sorry. That was a perfect opportunity for me to mess with this guy, you know, because I have a reputation to uh, uphold. Oh, <laughs> I think your hat and your beard have a better one, at least according to your own words. So. Do you think reputation and brand are the same thing? Um, I, I think that they can definitely be different. Um, but at least when you're a, when you're a solopreneur or a small business, I think they're one and the same. Yeah. So, you know, if a, if a Coca-Cola truck gets in an accident, I don't necessarily begrudge the company. Right. Um, and I'll probably still drink their product. So, but you know, if I say something bad and stupid, right. I have a feeling people might begrudge me personally and also fault my company. So how about now? Hey, there he is. I made it. Hopefully Perfect. I don't have an echo. So the benefit of John being on here, is he, he's going to bring a, contractor perspective and he's drinking um calories free beer they're light <laughs> completely calorie free that's why it's see-through um anyway so he can bring a contractor perspective which is important for this particular show i think because we were starting to talk about some of these things i've got some comments i want to bring on before we get too much into the weeds on different things um give me coverage for repair if you're not allowed to do that total the roof they typically do. I think he's talking about State Farm and how they deal with things. You know, the repair versus replacement issue is something that if, if you get yourself into a position where you can get a repair approved, you can start working towards a uh, full roof without necessarily having to take a video and post it on social media and hurting yourself down the road with every State Farm adjuster ever. Right. And then he comes on and says, the egos and contractors' frustrations on getting the roof bought should stay out of files, inspections, and adjusters' meetings. And I will say this. I often, I often try to relate with the person I'm on site with if I'm in the field. And so I might talk about, in general, you know, contractors, public adjusters, or even um insurance adjusters as a whole, you know, just to get on the same page with somebody to agree with them on something because you need to agree with them on something before you can agree with them on everything. Yep. Um, but so I, I think that you could start talking about your frustrations if they're the kind of person that is into that kind of a conversation outside of that. You don't need to make that every conversation because that's not most people. So we always kind anyway. of work with, if I may, we always kind of broach it as a common ground. You know, I'm not only a contractor, I'm also a homeowner, you know, and I have, I'm subject to these same kinds of things. So, you know, it's, there's a general frustration in the insurance claim world without calling out specific adjusters or carriers or whatever, because you have to worry about two reputations as a contractor. You have to worry about your reputation with the carriers in general, but also with your individual homeowner and your community reputation based on the sum of all those homeowners. So you really got to take care of all that, you know, while working a claim. And as Javier said, don't let your ego get in the way. Don't go in there, you know, talking trash about everybody and, you know, bad. Mouth. It just makes you look bad. Whether or not what you say comes true, it still makes you look bad, like you're just bitter, you know. So you want to go into it with the, I'm well, here to do you a service. And, and, here's the, and here's the thing. So if you come into that and you have that expectation of it, what can you do? to manage that part of the process. Cause if it's that ingrained, it's part of the process, right? So if you know that it's coming, how can you use that to your advantage 
and how can you put something? So one of my, one of the more favorite comments that I've heard is, how do you get the file pregnant, right? Because once it's in the file, oh, it ain't it, it. You know, it's there. So how do you get that file? How long pregnant? ago was it that you heard that last? What's that? How long ago was it that you heard that last? Um, December, December, November last year. You're kidding that recently. Wow. Yeah. I haven't heard that comment in so long. That really? that came from some public adjusting firm sort of calling stuff a pregnant dog uh, for a long time. They, they had a I, macro yeah, they were handing out pregnant. at conventions. They had to get it pregnant, but that's a different podcast. It was like, Maybe it's unrelated. Maybe it's just a coincidence that they both use the word pregnant. But I, anyway, well, sorry. The, Keep well, going. Yeah. So the uh, <laughs> uh, plus, that can also be a hot topic given the current state of decisions in the world. But getting anything pregnant is a hot topic. Right. Correct. Correct. Um, so the uh, so, anyways, the like so if that's part of the process and you know that it's going to be there, it's an element of it. You know what are your what strategies are you deploying? How are you going to engage in dialogue? How are you going to engage in question asking that will flush out things that are going to help you down the road, right? So again, there's one goal, but there's many paths to get to it. So the, is this the classic Matt spilled on himself moment? Yeah, I did. I spilled all over myself yeah. just now. You know, having yes. having listened to most of your content in like the last ten days, it seems consistent. You like know, it. it's a brand. It decision, is. I think it is. You know yeah. it's going to happen when. So this is usually when he's a little bit peckish, at least from what I've seen. <laughs> so, uh, so I imagine this is that that peckish moment where the sugar is kind of just rushing in, um, you know, from the beer. Okay. So it, it gets there. So yeah. the, the real issue is that I have to get it past this great filter on my face. I, I am like a walking sperm whale. These are the teeth, and anything has to get through this. When I put something up to my mouth, I literally have to squish my beard and mustache in to get to my lips. And some of those hairs get in there. So I pull away. And if I pull away too much, all hell breaks just loose. And it just dribbles out of my mouth. And it's terrible. Shave that little spot where the cup goes. <laughs> See, so, yeah, that happens when you drink at work. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I, I, I will say all report. beauty, all beauty is pain, you know, and some, some of the sufferings on the outside too. So, yeah. 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 It is, is, uh, being an idiot. I think being an idiot can sometimes be vanity in itself because you enjoy the idea of just being retarded on screen. I don't know. You, uh, you embrace it. I embrace it. I know I'm going to make a fool of myself. It's inevitable. I say weird shit. I'm a weird guy. Well, it happens. And, and uh, so in our in our fourth dimension talk, right, or the fourth wall talk, that's that's where you being human builds your credibility, right? Oh, that's because true. You yeah. you know what you're gonna get. You know what that personality is, right? Or at least the one you want us to see. And and so that becomes the part of that consistency uh, and that brand that is Matthew Mulholland. <sighs> Everyone knows you don't go full retail. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> I love that movie. Right. All right. Yeah. My uh my business partners are rolling right now because I keep saying that word and they've told me I gotta stop saying that. Yeah, it, um, it'd be a good idea to stop. And CI logo might come down by the very next episode, as it turns out. It's very possible. Hey, I want to tell a story real quick because I uh this this will tie into our actual topic. I remember, and I want your opinion to this when it's done. I remember having a claim once with a new new IA that I had never met before. Or actually, it might have been a staffer. Um, I don't remember a specific. No, I do. It was with farmers. A staffer with farmers I'd never met before on site. He was new, and he definitely had an idea of how public adjusters worked and was combative immediately. Uh, which I'm usually able to overcome. Even though my van says, let us deal with the bull, most of the time I have so much fun with the people that I meet in the field that I'm able to overcome even that, even with a new person that has this perception, this stereotype of how this meeting is going to go because there is a, a shark of a public adjuster standing there. So we're talking about different things. He's not agreeing with anything. Um, he's, he's combating me on everything. And we get down 
and we talk to the policyholder and I'm in front of the policyholder with the, this guy and this guy starts bringing up things that we disagreed on in front of the policyholder. Now, I'm trying hard to deflect. There's no reason that me and this guy need to have an actual argument in front of the policyholder. It won't make either of us look good. So I'm trying to deflect and say that, that he and I can have a conversation about that later on. And he kept bringing these things up. I don't remember specifically what the argument was on, but he clearly wanted to hash it out in front of the policyholder. And I have a client that expects me to take care of them. So I have to save face. So after about three attempts to kind of push and try to give him some some commentary with my eyes, like, don't go there, man. You don't want to do this. Don't go there. He pushed one more time. And so I had the fight with him in front of the policyholder on whatever it was about. I don't ever remember. But I, I definitely tore him apart. And he definitely didn't look good. And I definitely made the policyholder feel very uncomfortable. And he walked away to go get in his car. And I spent a few seconds with the policyholder apologizing for having to do that. And then I ran up to his car and I made sure he didn't leave before I talked to him again, away from the policyholder. And I remember saying to this guy, listen, the next time we meet, I want you to understand what just happened over there in front of that policyholder doesn't have to happen. I really tried to deflect that conversation. I was trying very hard to tell you with my eyes not to make me do what I'm about to do. And you didn't understand. You didn't get my meaning. And that's fine. But in the future, if you have to have a conversation like that in front of the policyholder, I'm going to have to save face. They're my client. I have to do my job for them. If we'd have had that same conversation on the roof or on the ground without the policyholder around, you and I probably could have come to an agreement on that that was mutually beneficial. But we weren't able to do that because you wanted to have that conversation from the policyholder, even though I was really trying not to. So I don't want you to leave here thinking dealing with Matt is, is dealing with an asshole. I want you to leave here thinking, let me have private conversations with this guy so that we can come to some agreements without having to get the policyholder involved who's going to expect me to take their full side complete. And the next time I met that guy, he was happy-go-lucky. He was very happy to see me. And, and we never had a conversation like that in front of a policyholder again. And I got to tell you, changed everything about my dynamic with that particular adjuster. And even with adjusters I didn't meet with from farmers who must have heard that uh, story from this guy. But anyway, as far as a reputation goes, I think I built a good reputation with that guy, despite having to have a fight with him in front of a policy owner. I wish I remember what it was all about. Well, there's probably something to be said for, you know, knowing your stuff and standing your ground, not backing down. But then again, there's also a time and a place for everything, you know, and, and some things like, like we used to say in the Gulf of Mexico, you gotta leave your feelings at home, you know, and you don't want to come in and, and get into a pissing contest in front of it. And whether it's an insured who's not paying the, the adjuster per se, but you know, they're paying for you and your services. So yeah, they definitely want to have that professionalism be apparent. Thanks, Clint. Appreciate it, buddy. Looks like neck tattoos turned into a circle of optimism. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pull them off until he gets it together. Yeah. Uh, Clint Moore posts, uh, Matt's projecting was actually the person who got told off in front of someone else's client. Uh, yeah. Not this time. Um, <laughs> I've definitely been... I've not won that argument in front of the policyholder before, though. There have been times when I did not win that. Um, that time I did. But, yeah, now that happens too, Clint. So, you know, if, if you do it, if you have a fight in front of someone, what what potential downfall is there to having a fight with a carrier in front of a policyholder? Um, so, uh I think the downfall is, is the loss of credibility, right? Uh, that you could have with your client. So basically a lot of what you've already touched on. Um, you know, I think the, I think the difference is, is going into it. So like you tried, you tried to smize at the person 
right? Um, when instead, he you know, I was coming on to him or something. Right. Well, you know, the a lot can get lost in the beard, right? Uh, the hat has its own voice. Um, yeah. So, so the so one of the one of the things you could uh, try to do differently next time, or or go through that process. One is before you're cl- like before they even get there, get there early enough to talk to your client, set an expectation of what could come out of it today, right? So you know, uh, like lay out the scene. Hey, I haven't I haven't dealt with this adjuster before, or I have. This is what I what I'm expecting of this adjuster today. This is what you can expect of me today. You know, in the past, these have been some of my experiences where things don't go according to this, right? We're going to do our best to mitigate this. If you happen to see this and if you're ever uncomfortable, don't feel like you have to stay there. You can walk away, right? Um, you know, so all of that kind of stuff. So, so you know, being aware of depending on who your client is, right? So the the 80-year-old little old lady versus the 22-year-old neck tattoo guy, right? Like being aware of what... Um, Four, 45 year old neck tattoo oh, guys. 40, yeah, 40. 40. Okay, yeah. So I'm right there. Just they're just not on my neck, um, but respect for it. Uh, so the uh, uh, so you know it's that type of thing, like knowing who your audience is and, and preparing them. As far as the adjuster goes, like so this is that um, kind of like that uh, integrative and distributive uh, kind of situation that I I like to try to create, right? So going back to like that video that we saw, right? It was a very distributive conversation. So a distributive conversation is when we're arguing about this thing that's in front of us and we think all there is is to divide this thing, right? And so an integrative conversation is recognizing the universe of interests and positions that exist all around the thing that we're going to discuss, right? And so when this person is, is you know, trying to, quote unquote, win points in front of the client, right? And so they're going to lay out their positions Right. And they're going to talk about this distributive thing, this small object that we want to segment and cut up. This part of the roof isn't covered. This part is I'll pay for that slope. I'm not doing ice and water shield here. I'm doing it here. You know, whatever. Right. Those mm-hmm. are that's them cutting up this thing that's in front of us. The integrative conversation as a skilled advocate, as a con- as you guys are when you come into those things, is recognizing the universe of positions and interests that exist around it. Right. So what is the prop? What is the promise that's actually owed under the policy? Right. How do we go back to a common interest, which is making sure that the benefits that are owed under the policy are being conveyed? Right. So so asking questions, it's so rarely that it's the things you say that influence someone else. It's the questions you ask and the answers they give you that end up putting them on the path towards agreeing with you. Right. And so it's heard this, you know, in some manner, they just don't employ this. It, you know, you control the conversation if you're the one asking questions. Yep. Everyone knows that they've all heard it before, but yep. so rarely do people actually use that. Right. They get caught up in the heat of the moment. You know, I assume mm-hmm. we're talking about the, that my state farm video that's been rampant across yeah, the interwebs. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, they, they get caught up in the heat of the moment, you know, they, they get, again, yeah. beating their chest and let their egos get a hold of them. And, you know, yeah, there is a lot of value in being a subject matter expert with being a contractor and knowing how to properly repair things or replace things. But at the end of the day, you know, you don't really know the policy that you're not supposed to even speak on as a contractor, but to maintain composure and put together a tactful argument as to why. And regardless of coverage, the repair still doesn't change. If they don't have ordinance law, you still have to put on those items, you know, to, to just kind of maintain your stance, stay in your ground like Matt did. Right. <laughs> sure. And that's and that's and that's one of the things. So the the comment that just came up that spoke to positions, right? So if you ever find yourself writing the word because, you're taking a position, right? Da 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 because of X Y Z, right? So you're you're putting a position out there. If you're actually speaking to the interest. Right. So the thing that's beyond what it is that you're actually trying to talk about, the the finding the common interests in the conversation is where you can actually make progress. Right. So you can have a set of facts and both sides will look at facts differently and then they'll use the facts to build their positions. Right. Relative to everything else that comes behind it. But it loses the interests. Right. So, for example, like an interest of that claim handler could be a closed file. Right. They just want they like doesn't care how they get it closed. They just want a closed file. What's yeah. the path of re- least resistance to a closed file? Right. 
Um, they just want uh, they just want their manager to give them a good review, right? Um, so how do we help that adjuster look good? What are their interests? What are the things that we can influence, not control, but influence, right, to start moving that thing in the direction we want it to go? And that's that's the the psychology part. That's the listening between the words. That's you know uh, you know. I imagine most people sitting sitting here listening to the podcast have either been contractors or uh, IAs or something like that, where you think of all of the things that why you're there that day looking at that roof is to potentially support your family if you're the contractor, right? You're there to generate revenue. Those are all of your other interests. Um, you know, Neck Tattoo just shared his interest is maintaining his license, right? I'm going to do things that are in compliance with the code so that I can continue to practice the trade that I, I know and I employ, right? So, so those are all of his interests that bring him, that he brings with him to every job he shows up at, right? And conveying your interest to the policyholder uh, and to the carrier become key. Hey, no matter what you're paying for, my interest is to give them a roof that is code compliant. I, I can't do anything less. That's my floor. Whether they have the coverage for it or not, they should talk to a PA about that, right? Sure. So Eric, Eric says, sometimes people are just having a bad day, cutting people slack and having the most tact is the way to best serve the homeowner. Maybe they are nice, less reasonable next time. And, and that is the case sometimes, you know? Right. Um, I remember having an argument with an IA on site about repairability and I was showing him how I determine repairability and he thought I was being ridiculous because we were talking about a three or four year old roof. And he said that I was, he said, and I quote, motherfucking PAs always talking down to me, condescending motherfuckers. And he walked away all huffy and pissed off and everything on the roof. And, uh, and I was surprised and, you know, I, I could fight back right now. I could do something. And instead, um, instead of me arguing why I'm doing what I'm doing or why I'm saying what I'm saying, my reaction was, how do I diffuse this so that we end up leaving here as friends? Now he just fucked up. He just said some words that he probably shouldn't have said as a professional. I could continue and, and do the same thing. And then we're both on the same page again, or I could do what's best for my client and suck it up and have him only be the, the, be the only one that was unprofessional. So I literally said to him, listen, sometimes I can't tell what I'm coming across as condescending. I'm really sorry if I did, it wasn't my intention. I just explained things. Sometimes I over explain. I didn't mean to, if that's the way I came off, I'm really sorry. And he went, and turned around and walked back across the roof again, and then eventually came back and said, all right, I'm sorry, man. I'm going to buy the roof. My bad. And the next time I met him, this was during Hurricane Michael, the next time I met him, we didn't have any fights at all, and he started bitching at me about other PAs. And so there's, there became a reputation there of me being fair, even though originally I was part of the same pool of bullshit that he's used to dealing with. Uh, but yeah, sometimes people are just having a bad day. Maybe he was that day. I don't know. He definitely screwed up. And if that had gotten back to his management, he could have had a problem. Right. Well, so, and that's, and that's kind of one of those Sarah Parker moments, right? Like where you could, you could kind of call a timeout on the issue of what's going on and just address them as a human, like human to human. Hey, are you having a good day today? You know, yeah. like, and I don't know how tall the roof is that you're standing on, but you know, that problems, right? So like, hey, like, or hey, I've got an extra Gatorade in my truck. You know, would you like to take a moat? Like, let's take 10 yeah. and just, You're you starting know. to act like Betty White. Have a fucking yeah, snicker. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> right? So it's, you know, it's those, it's that, it's just going beyond the issue and actually going to the human level and creating that human connection. I mean, Matt, that's, it sounds like that's a lot of what your playbook is, like even apologizing, right? Like, like a lot of people would not have, had the awareness of how they communicate to take that moment to apologize. Well, yeah, I think it, well, shit, anything that I say at this point is going to sound self-serving as hell. I'm going to sound arrogant for a moment. We're used I, to it. It's brand. It's consistent. Is it? Am I arrogant? Shit. No, I don't think so. Actually, <laughs> honestly, having, having had you in my head for the last few out, like, like the last week for hours while I was driving, 
Um, uh, if that's a person's impression, they need to listen longer. Um, I, well, see okay. self, I see I a see a selfless that. giver. So see? that's what he I just see. did it himself. Yeah. I, I think that it take you know uh, an above average intelligence person will typically have a lot more introspection than the average person. And so you'll start to think, what well, was I wrong more often than not? And try to take the other person's perspective. I think that's a healthy thing to do from a claim side of things. Take their perspective. You've been saying, uh, you know, multiple motivations surrounding a claim, understanding what this person wants out of it. It's going to be different from what you want. But if you can fulfill what they want, you'll actually be more successful and you'll get what you want more often than not. Uh, what that guy needed was was very different from what I needed. Uh, and yeah. you know, it, it took a lot. It sounds easy for me to say, but it took a lot to swallow my pride in that moment. Those and aren't say, easy moments. I'm yeah. sorry when I feel like I didn't do anything wrong. But from his perspective, maybe I was being condescending. And I do that sometimes. I know I do. Anybody that explains anything, they call it mansplaining, don't they? Yeah. Right? Anybody that explains anything as if they're some kind of an expert on something, they, they can come off as condescending, especially if you already know what that is. And you're not giving them an opportunity to speak. I'm sure I come off as condescending. So I recognize in that moment that it was possible that he really did take it that way. Um, and I apologize. And it, and it did work out. Um, and, and to be honest, I've done that a lot with a lot of different things over my life. And it has worked out most times. I've gotten I've had that argument. I've had a lot of different business partners over the years. I've had a lot of fights with business partners. I think you'll find if you're having a fight with a business partner that if you're the one that apologizes, they'll start saying all the things that they were saying wrong suddenly instead of contradicting everything. It's it's surprising. Whoever backs down first wins instead of the opposite. And maybe there's a chart that could show that as a progression. The, the more often, maybe there's statistical analysis there that could be a lot of fun. I can tell you this, if I'm fighting with my wife, I don't care if I'm right or not. She's right. And I just need to walk away. <laughs> I have a good question for you. What is more important for a public adjuster? Have you a reputation of being fair or a reputation of being a bulldog? Ooh. Are those the only two choices? If that is the only two choices, yeah. what do you think would be more beneficial? Um, I would rather be fair. I'd rather be known as a fair adjuster than a bulldog adjuster. Well, why can't there be a hybrid? Why can't you be fair he, he, but he, a bulldog? He didn't, he, a bulldog? he didn't phrase the question in a way that allowed it us he to actually a dichotomy. We wanted to dance. It's a false dichotomy for, for sure. Look for coverage. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, no. So, honestly, it, um, the bulldog side implies uh, – keep in mind, I'm a bulldog guy. I've got three of them. So, English bulldogs, if you're out there, uh, fellow English bulldog lovers. Um, but the – I like the tenacity part that comes with being a bulldog. I don't like the way that other people would uh, would kind of clarify that or understand it, right? Like if I said, oh, that's Matt Mulholland, he's a real bulldog, right? Or hell, that's Matt Mulholland, he's really fair, right? I, yeah. It carries with it a different thing. Right? Anybody can be, one or the other, but the reputation is what people assume is going to, to happen. Right. So well, I think Matt, if, I can, if I can back up for a moment... Uh, can I can I plug a book I have no affiliation with, but just enjoy? No, no. Most of us don't right. read. Oh, okay. Well, anyways. No, well, so when you were talking about the tactical I knew, I knew emotional that. empathy, this, I knew this, this book is good. That book is really good for tactical <laughs> emotional for empathy. For all of you that are listening to this instead of watching it and couldn't see that book, um, I'll narrate for you. He left it up, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, uh, which is actually one of the better... I can, can I uh, can I admit something to you guys? This is a confession. Oh, You're with friends. I absolutely hate self help books. I hate them. I hate them with a passion. I can't stand them. I, I can't. I get lost in them. I just zone out. I start thinking about other th shit. I can't watch. I can't listen to it. I can't read it. I can't. Oh, they're the worst. I don't see is how anybody reads these things regularly. 
that book is the only audio book that would I would categorize as self-help that I was able to listen to because it was interesting. Book. He had a lot of stories in there. It's actually a great book. So, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it as self-help because there's actually a how-to guide in the back. So if you only yeah. did the audio version, there's literally, there's literally worksheets in the back of the book for you yeah. to take your issues that you're trying to navigate and actually mind map out and uh, build tactical empathy strengths and things through it. Uh, so you can take it, make it practical. So make it there's, practical? There's, yeah, you can, it's actually becomes practical. Like it's not just like a froofy, you know, uh, know your why, you know, kind of stuff. The secret. So, yeah. The secret. Know your why. Yeah. <laughs> So that's a, different, that's a different. I'm that's actually a different using version. the book right now. Yeah. Oh, you're reading. Yeah, so that's a good one too. So the uh, and what's the other one? Hang on, I've got it around here somewhere. I wanted uh, to make a video, a funny video at some point of two people that read that book and were mirroring a lot of people, and then they start talking to each other, and they're constantly mirroring each other. Yeah. And and it gets shorter and shorter. They start with, uh, "Oh, you're new here, new here." Here, <laughs> eventually they're like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> right. I think that would be funny. Yeah. You, you can't mirror back and forth. It doesn't work. It has to be one way only. Right. It's about winning. It's a really good book. I think he meant award winning or it's about winning. Yeah. No. That makes more sense. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a fair bulldog conversation. Yeah. Self-improvement, personal development. So what kind of a book is it if it's not self-help? It'd be in a self-help section at a bookstore if they still existed. It's like an industry specific kind of guide, I would think. You know, it's more it's, I mean, it's it's in general. Well, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I take it as I take it as like a beginner course to negotiation. Um, and then if you want to get more into negotiation, uh, these are these are two of my favorites. So the the negotiator's field book, the desk reference for the experienced negotiator. So lots of examples, lots of different tactics to employ, uh, all kinds of stuff. This is very heavy and technical. And then uh, dispute resolution above the adversarial model. That's another good one. Um, I was at uh, an event with uh, Rand Man. He had an entrepreneurist event in Jacksonville last weekend. And he was actually talking about the Chris Voss book. And he, was, he had a whole discussion about tactical empathy um, and how he went about it. It was, it was pretty good. Um, and that was an interesting event because he had people from all different industries coming together at the same time. Right. Never seen that before. It was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, um, if you, if you like to watch things, uh, like their YouTube channels, pretty good. Um, as far as just getting, you know, different content, different things. So, yeah. Yeah. That's true. So, you know, when, when it comes to, uh, negotiations. I think that there's one good thing that you, you could take away from, from this. If you want to have a good reputation, remember that the person you're dealing with is a human. Remember that they have needs and desires and motivations that are different from yours and try to help them with that. Um, and then if you just remember those two things, chances are good. You're going to make the right decisions on the way that you communicate with them. There's a third there's one. Different. And you've said it. You've said it every time. You're going to see them again. That's true. They're probably stalking you as well. I've gotten a few videos of mine sent to my email um, from a claims adjuster that watched a video where I talked about the bullshit that was happening in that particular claim from them, and they sent me the video as if that's going to change my opinion. Uh, maybe it was a scare tactic. I'm not really sure. On, on certain ones that that has happened, trust me, it was, there was a lot of bullshit on that side. Uh, here's Jonathan Bryant. When I was an IA, if someone was trying to bulldog me, I made it very difficult to approve future claims when the damage was not very apparent. That's a good point. Part of a good reputation with a carrier means that there's going to be 50-50 claims where they can lean one way or the other. Guess which way they're going to learn if you, they don't like you. Right. So, learn. Matt, I say quick learn? question. Do you I said learn, learn, but, you know, you're <laughs> you're half a beer in, so we expect it. Um, <sighs> the uh, quick question. Do you have any tattoos? No, I'm um, 
I'm afraid virgin of soil. Needles. Virgin soil. So, so neck tattoo, you've got them. I've got them. I don't know if you guys have seen them, but I've got them. So yeah. uh, I love the show Ink Master back in the day when that was still being made. And there was a, there was a moment on this show where one artist was talking to another, you know, in the background or whatever, back at the house. And they were saying, yeah, like when you have that client that's, you know, really rude and da-da-da-da-da, so you set your gun differently so that the tattoo hurts more, hurts. right? And yeah. so the tattoo artist that gave that description, the other one said, what the hell are you doing, right? This person's entrusted you with something that they should wear forever. Why would you ever try to purposefully inflict pain on this person, right? It and so and so the reason why I kind of bring this back to to what you were saying or bring that analogy into this is the comment that came through, right? Like like they're gonna take their discretion out on the policyholder because of the person that's in front of them helping that person with the claim. That's like exactly. You're, 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 you're inflicting pain intentionally for nothing that anyone else faulted. Like that homeowner did nothing wrong. They needed right. help and, and they hired help. Right. That's exactly what I was getting ready to jump in and say is, yeah. you know, by denying a claim because you don't like the contractor, that contractor can go next door and get that job too. You're not hurting him. You Okay. So you waste an hour of his time, but really the long-term Ooh. effects are on the homeowner who you, un, you know, justly, deny the claim i mean you gotta think that's kind of weird we're tactful salesmen you know we know how to locate the damage from you know recent storms identify it push it encapsulate entire neighborhoods denying one yeah it's pain in the ass you're wasting my time but it ain't hurt me you know right. we're still doing you know, we live in the we live in reality though that this is happening regardless yeah. Both sides are at fault here. It, the yeah. carrier shouldn't be, or the the adjuster shouldn't be determining whether or not there is or isn't coverage based on whether or not they like the contractor or public adjuster that's there. It should have nothing to do with it. So, but we also live in reality. Yeah. So the public adjuster could, or contractor could avoid a situation where the carrier or the adjuster is likely to take an opposing viewpoint because of previous experience with that person, then Shame on you for having that previous experience. This policyholder was counting on both of you. Yeah. Who's yeah. really in the wrong? Right. Unless it was that policyholder that filed another bullshit claim in the past. Don't take it out on them. <laughs> There's know? that too. There's a lot of that. <laughs> I need to that. have a video. We haven't done an episode on bullshit from the policyholder side yet. We could. From the policyholder I've got some examples. Yeah. Some yeah, Somebody would be really good at that. I've done vandalism claims where I was like number four on there and, you know, the contractor wise and, you know, the, I, we knew it, the, the carrier knew it, the policy holder was a little bit oblivious, but he just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. I want this bought, you know, I need this bought. He did have legit damage. It was just minimal. So some other contractor went up there and made it less minimal. Apparently we just classify as different type of loss. Do either of you feel like you sound like Matthew McConaughey? Do we? All right, all right, all right. I just make that yeah. my new podcast. I was gonna say that's got to be neck tattoo. That I've it's I don't gotta know be right that way. Well, I mean, I, I've been told I look like them, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the hair. <laughs> you probably don't float down rivers naked in your in your dreams or anything either. Nah, I have a lake out of river. That's yeah. that's the th one of three books that I have read that would fall under a self help title one of them was green lights by matthew mcconaughey read by matthew mcconaughey on audible i like that because he actually uh he put some drama to it and then there was the chris Voss book and the other one was actually written by uh jim carrey and i don't think i finished it because it was just too fucking weird yeah. you know uh, if you ever have a long time and you're on audible check out um how to make friends and influence people from like the 1930s yeah, yeah. um it's uh, it's got a lot of good stuff in there, so it's I'll a little hard to audible. But... version. What's that? Ask questions about that person. Yeah. Done. Yeah. That's the whole book. Yeah. Yeah. But they tell a lot of good stories to get there. Sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I never read the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, like the, the, the best to take with them 
is, you know, you guys both have a job to do, you know, go up there. You're there to fix it. They're there to, you know, find coverage, whether or not it's there. Come to terms, be respectful, you know, like you were guys saying, be understanding. And sometimes you get adjusters that are just hell bent or you get contractors that are hell bent, but you know, it doesn't hurt to go in open-minded and just, Hey man, here's another one. You know, this whole neighborhood's been smashed. I'm tired. I've been here all week doing these, you know, I'm sure you are too. You're probably on deployment. You got Texas tags on your truck or whatever, you know, and just find a relation, you know, like something that relates to them. I think I'm, as far as reputation goes, I've I've definitely benefited from having a fair reputation. Um, but there are a lot of PAs and contractors, especially PAs in, in what I would call high leverage states like Florida, Texas, maybe Colorado. Um, those kind of states because of the, the fee shifts. You now, they, these, these public adjusters, is, it's like their balls get 10 times heavier suddenly and they and they just want to fight everybody and prove that they're wrong. When's the last time proving that an adjuster was wrong worked out in your favor on a claim without it having to go to legal? Just about never. Let me say this, and we're going to have to shut this episode down. Maybe come back to it because it's actually really interesting. Let me say this. Um, if you ever have to prove that someone is wrong in a claim and you're pushing them towards that proverbial corner and you're trying to ask them questions that make them admit that they were wrong. If you're asking yes or no questions, is this damage? What's the definition of damage? If you're asking them questions that they would not legally be able to, well, not legally, they would not be able to answer because their legal departments would never let them because there would be consequences beyond this one claim. If you ever ask them a question like that, they're not going to answer it. They'd rather it go to litigation. Don't ask them questions that they can't answer without having long-term consequences. If you put them into a corner where they have to answer a question like that, they're just not going to answer it or they're going to answer it wrong. And it's not going to benefit you or your client, and you're going to end up in litigation. It's going to take two more years. If you ask them right. questions and really open up to them and actually treat them like a human instead, you might actually get somewhere a lot more often. Yeah. I already I'll, give them a, a way out. Yeah, show, um, show me what you think it is or, you know, you know, have yeah. them kind of put it in their park, you know, say, well, well if it's not, I mean, what, what do you think it is? And I'm not saying this to, you know, be objective, but, you know, just I'm trying to learn, you know, what, what, is it about this damage that doesn't look like hail or doesn't look like wind in your opinion? Yeah. You know, let, let them explain it. Let them give them a chance. Open ended questions, not yes or no, can help out tremendously, especially if you actually listen. Yeah. Keep an open mind. Matt, uh, Javier asked if I was writing a book. I just said that I don't even read these books. Um, if I were to write one, that would seem really. Um, no, Matt. What's the word? Matt, here's here's um, your book. Um, the the objective the objective observer so there's your title and you uh -huh. talk about that you talk about things that are objective damage and the way to quantify it like that sounds really that's so boring. much that's so much of what you do it's not boring because it's a it would be a technical ma manual of wizardry right <laughs> that that can take people through like the side by sides like i think it's you know, it's a flip book it's a picture book it's you know, no. it has to be a picture. Answers, yeah. Like, like it's, you know, not, think of, think of the NCI textbook, right? <laughs> so the National Claims Institute textbook of damage. No, Matt and I are good friends. And we spend many a, a time like drinking beer and going through shit. I'm going to tell you right now, if he wrote a book, it would be the most boring book you've ever, he will try, he will analyze every little sentence he wrote and explain it in, in, in triple time. Yeah. It, it, It'd be four thousand pages, and that's fairly um, accurate. So, yeah. so, so, two <laughs> things: ghostwriter, and and focus focus on telling people what time it is, not how the clock is made, and and you'll get there. That's what he's incapable of. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, then, like so then, so yeah. then, it's it's Matt Mulholland and neck tattoo bring you right, and neck tattoo makes it the readability part. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. the after the book, you see neck tattoos chime in. Uh, right. Matt, shut the fuck up. You're done with this conversation. Let's move on to the next topic already. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, that's how every chapter ends. <laughs> commentary from neck tat. 
yada yada yada. Hey, whatever, so long. Yeah. Whatever, gets, whatever gets whatever gets the byline of neck tattoo. I think that's the key. <laughs> that's the part. Yeah, I, if people pay money to come to my classes, I want to give them all the information, not surface level crap that they're going to get from everyone else. So yeah, yeah, right. they're going to get detailed. John, it's going to be detailed. No, it, yeah, Deal no, it's it. a blessing and a curse. I'm just saying, if you were yeah. left in a room by yourself to write a book, it would be 8,000 pages by the end of the afternoon, and you probably would I be think on the biggest issue topic. would be just how much, how convoluted it would be. It would be all over the place. It, it, yeah. Yeah. I, I now, see, my day with squirrel protocol. I have to force myself to do things in certain orders just so I don't go squirrel and, and go right. off to something else. It's very difficult. And that's um, why the class structure is great because, you know, we got the curriculum, you know, you're kind of following. But then we get the the questions from the, the students and it runs off on a cool tangent. But then you kind of get this snap to reality. Oh, wait, I got to get back to the curriculum. So it keeps the book very condensed, but still a lot of great information and side notes. So I don't know who a Facebook user is, but they said Grant Cardone and Gary V don't read books, but they write books. Is that true? Do you happen to know if Gary V is like that? I'm, I don't, I don't really know care that. for Grant that I know much, he works with a ghostwriter, like. typically. I, I don't know that he doesn't read books, but he's had a lot of bestsellers. Huh. Odd. Actually. Not how the clock is made. What if it? What if it's about how to build a clock, guys? God. Well, that, that, that's a I narrower audience. David Summer. That makes sense. Actually, he would know. All right. This has been a much more interesting topic than I was anticipating. And just like every other topic that I ever talk about, John, I want to keep going for the next three hours to really dig all the way through it. But I realize that we can't in one hour. That's impossible. So if you are a listener to this show, you're just going to have to live with disappointment because we have to end it here. I'm very sorry. Just email Matt a very technical question about reputation and stand by for the long response. I have a feeling David is the same way. Uh, so the advice about the clock is real. I learned I learned that um, when you start reporting to CEOs and things like that, you learn how to lead with the time. You you Ooh. still put the clock is in there, how the clock works, but you learn to lead with the time. All right, guys. Um, I really appreciate your time, David. Neck tattoo, you suck. Uh, <laughs> I say everything with the most love and respect, man. Uh, if, if you'll stick on in the background, David, I'll have a chat with you in just a second, all right? But I'm going to boot you both off. Ba bam, ba bam. Um, David came to me from Sarah Parker. And when she watches this episode, she's probably going to reach out to me and say the following I told you the guy's freaking brilliant. Uh, you, you could tell that there's a lot there. And he's probably dug into the psychology of things a lot more than most people. I can tell you this. Um, I've, I've not done that, but I've taken the approach in my thought process to try to evaluate what uh, what people's motivations are for anything that I'm doing. I think that that's important to do. So uh, someone like David Princeton is, is probably an important person for you to know. That guy is clearly wildly smart. Wicked smart, you might even say if you were from the Northeast. Wicked smart. Um, and so is Sarah Jessica Parker. Sarah Jessica Parker? Why did I? David, damn it. Sarah Mary Parker. Anyway, these people are good to know uh, because they can help you out tremendously and they can give you some insight on things that you don't normally think about. I think it's important for you to build a Rolodex of people like this so that you can ask them interesting and odd questions. And I'd have them on the screen still, except uh, if I said this while they were on the screen, they would continue talking and I need to shut this thing down. So if you like this show and you're getting a lot out of it, understand, we don't make any money on this. Uh, but you can help support this show by purchasing a shirt. I don't have one to show you right now, but if you go to listen to this bowl.com, you can get a shirt. You can have it shipped directly to you in whatever size you want. There's some pretty cool ones on there. And they're they're pretty great. Um, and that, that the money that we make from those uh, can help support the show by giving us enough to maintain our equipment at the very least. 
Uh, but I appreciate you guys, and I will see you next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Oh, one last thing I almost forgot. Uh, coming up in July at the National Claims Institute, our newest sponsor. You, you see there? Logo right up, right up there. Our newest sponsor for, listen to this bull, um, because they're a sponsor, I can actually talk about this shit now. We've got the Dealing with Engineer Chicago and Denver coming up next week. Monday is Chicago. Friday is Denver. The Denver one is in the exact same place as the uh, American Policyholder Association, the APA, APassociation.org. They are doing a members-only uh, meeting in Denver. My Dealing with Engineers class, or NCS Dealing with Engineers class, is in the exact same building the day after. So if you are going to the APA thing, uh, please consider purchasing a ticket to that. I will be speaking for an hour about that class and, and about other things that happen in that class uh, during the APA event as well. Um, and then the following week, I've got uh, the National Claims Institute has two classes going on at the same time. I'm sorry. No, it's not that week yet. It's the week after that. We're going to do composition shingle roof inspection certification course. Um, and at the exact same time, we're going to have the very first um, hurricane training. We're going to call it Cat 5 hurricane training. If you are all thinking about dealing with hurricanes or dealing with hurricane losses, this is a two-day course that we are building out right now with eight different instructors in order for everybody to give uh, their two cents on what it is that they're most expert at during this. So we've got eight different people, including Cal Spoon, Sean Hodge, um, John Edwards, Frank Dalton, Daniel Rabowski, Neck Tattoo, who was on here earlier, is actually going to speak. I've got a portion of myself, Remington Huggins. We're all going to be teaching you about hurricane losses and what it takes to not only do them as a contractor, doing emergency services type things, what it is to bring with you, but also how to deal with the coverage concerns to go along with it and settlement uh, settlement trends to go along with that. Two full days, very, very full days. Really, it ought to be a three-day class, uh, but we've got it in two, and it will be available online for you to check out as well. So we're going to have that up and running and able to be purchased later today. Someone says the cart is not working for Chicago. Uh, please PM me after the class, and I'll, I'll, I'll work with you on that. I don't know what's going on there. I'll, I'll try to figure that out with you afterwards. All right, so if you guys uh, want to check that out, I'd appreciate it. And I'll post a video about what's going on in National Claims Institute for the month of July later today. See you guys next Tuesday at 6 p.m.